The title of my talk this morning is A Holy Discontentment. A Holy Discontentment. Um, I have noted in recent months that there is a healthy development within the body of Christ. There is what I would call a holy discontentment developing in more and more redeemed hearts. A growing dissatisfaction with where things seem to have plateaued at. Sunday church service, good. Daily quiet times, good. Bible study, good. Midweek cell group gathering, good. All good. But is that it? Is that all there is to the Christian lifestyle? Yes, all these things provide us with precious kingdom manna. They provide us with good spiritual food. But as the food goes in, where is the outworking fruitfulness? As a committed Christian who loves the body of Christ, I have to be honest and say that the fruitfulness in, in most church fellowships is sparse. And I think that there's a reason why. So often we have a wrong understanding of what the Christian lifestyle should be like. Photography is, is my hobby. And I pray that I honor God with the gifting that he has graciously given me. If you've ever visited my photography website, you will see nearly 600 photographs that still give me great pleasure to look at. But only those who take photography seriously might know that every picture has gone through an enhancement program that's designed to bring out the very best in it. Software programs such as Photoshop or Aperture can have up to 25 sliders at the side of the photograph, all of which can alter the photograph in certain but very significant ways. If the fields are not green enough, then I might gently slide the saturation slider a little to the right. If it's too bright, I might slide another slider a bit to the left. I'm not adding to the photo, I'm simply working with the existing raw ingredients, pushing some of the ingredients forward and pulling some of the other ones back until I get the beautiful image that I, that I desire. You, you get the idea. If I move any slider too far to the right or too far to the left, the picture quickly becomes unpleasant to look at. And so it is with teaching kingdom truth. There are many kingdom ingredients to work with, many sliders to work with. There's the love of God, the reverential fear of God, repentance, grace, mercy, holiness, humility, holy boldness, commandments, waiting on the Lord, resting, obedience, service, the judgments, heaven, hell, etc. And the master's hand alone knows how to nudge a slider a little to the left or a little to the right to produce a well-balanced image that would reveal the image of Christ in us and in our midst. We've all met Christians who are clearly out of balance and the world is quick to tar us all with the same brush. We know how popular what I sometimes irreverently call the gospel of me has become and the great crowds that are drawn to it. God loves you and has a plan for your life and he wants to prosper you and bless you in every possible way. In other words, Give your life to Jesus and your life will be enhanced. There is, of course, truth in this. And it's understandably popular because we all want to be loved, prospered, and blessed in every possible way. But when this truth slider is pushed way off to the right and left there, a wrong image of Christ begins to develop among his people, revealing a self-conscious self-centered church that the world does not even have a sneaking regard for. 
Let me give you an example of this. Someone excitedly posted on a friend's Facebook page an online daily teaching by a very popular teacher stating that God is richly blessing Christians, for example, by miraculously clearing their financial debts, granting average students straight A's in their exams, winning property in a supermarket lucky draw, and assuring Christians that if their blessing hasn't already come, it is certainly on its way. He said, so the next time somebody gets blessed, tell yourself, I won't be disheartened. I won't be jealous. I'm the next one to be blessed. And assuring them that when these blessings come, they would be mighty. Saying, in fact, you will not be able to take it uh, at all because when the blessings start coming in, they will come in in a net-breaking, boat-sinking style. You will have to call your friends in other boats to come and help you. So it's easy to see how self-interest rises to such teaching. My flesh rises easy to it, but it points me in the wrong direction. It's not the New Testament tone of voice. It's not the early church example. It's not a Christ or apostle or disciple modeled lifestyle. The online responses that flowed uh, beneath that teaching were, I suppose, predictable and included these very excited statements in capital letters and exclamation marks. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I am thankful for all that you're giving me. Now I'm ready to receive the red sports utility vehicle from you. Thank you very much. Amen, exclamation, exclamation. We are next, exclamation, exclamation. We claim it in Jesus' name, exclamation, exclamation. I claim it, hallelujah. I am next in capital letters, exclamation. Amen, exclamation. It's my turn in capital letters. Yes, indeed, I am next, next in line for signs and wonders, next in line for a miraculous outpouring of wealth and unlimited prosperity from the benevolent Lord God in the mighty name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, exclamation, exclamation. God's word tells us that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8, 29. Do you sense that the truth slider is being pushed too far to the right and that a wrong image of God's Son is being developed within his body here on earth? Ron Hutchcraft, in his article called Escaping the Me Monster, wrote, Too often life is about my needs, my issues, my problems, my agenda, my feelings, my load. But a life of self-focus or self-pity or self-centeredness is just not how we are wired to live, especially if we belong to Jesus Christ. So this morning, let me push that slider towards the left in order to develop a more accurate image of Jesus. Let me administer the antidote to the me monster. Let me drop in an explosive three-word perspective-changing sentence. Here it is. The sacrificial lifestyle. For the Christian who has a growing holy discontentment, there is just no escaping this vital aspect of our relationship with God. In our fallen humanity, we are naturally keener to primarily focus on our needs than on the needs of others. Christians and non-Christians, Jews and Gentiles, all have the same needs, food, drink, clothing, etc., but listen, Jesus said that our Heavenly Father knows that we, his children, have need of such things. And that our primary focus is not on these things, but on his kingdom. Matthew six thirty one to 33. Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? Or what shall I eat, what shall I drink, what shall I wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added on to you. When I was younger, I remember an advertising campaign 
that was designed to evoke support for the rapidly growing number, uh, numbers of lorries that were starting to dominate our roads. Lorries are not a big problem on motorways, but along narrow roadways or when delivering, maneuvering, or parking in busy city streets, they can definitely create problems. So quite a task, you might think, for the advertising agency that was asked to change the perspective on them. But they nailed it with just one sentence. If you have it, it came by lorry. I, I, I tried to wriggle out of that broad sweeping statement, but by and large it convinced me. <laughs> and I softened my frustration towards the mobile monsters and their crews. It, it was a perspective changing statement. So here is the perspective changing statement for this morning's kingdom teaching. If you have it, it came by sacrifice. Sacrifice simply permeates scripture from beginning to end. It's impossible to miss that. The very word itself occurs around 150 times. From the earliest chapters in scripture, it becomes clear that our relationship with God always has sacrifice at its core. The seemingly endless and very bloody Old Testament sacrifices from man's side towards God were but a shadow of the shockingly dramatic sacrifice that at the right time would come from God's side towards man. Hanging on that cruel Roman cross, God's bloodied son became the once and for all time sacrificial lamb. And that selfless sacrifice changed everything. From that sacrificial event and its climatic it is finished moment, we would forever come to God through the once sacrificed and forever risen Jesus. And God's blessings would forever come to us through the once sacrificed and forever risen Jesus. Yes, everything we have has come to us by sacrifice. But you know that. You know that. Here's where we're going with this. The redeemed Christian lifestyle was always meant to be a sacrificial lifestyle. Because loving always involves sacrifice. And sacrifice always costs you something. Otherwise, it's not sacrificial. King David said in 2 Samuel 2.24, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. All precious kingdom advances have come and will continue to come through the Christian sacrificial lifestyle to one degree or another. Think of the, the first apostles, the first disciples, the early persecuted church. Think of the 15th and 16th century martyrs who died in the flames rather than compromise on biblical truth. The centuries of mostly unknown missionaries who gave up the blessings of a normal life and went to the furthermost corners of the earth. Think of the tireless Bible translators who have had to study and learn many strange languages and dialects so that every tribe and tongue might have God's word brought to them. Think of the away from family time that traveling evangelists and itinerant teachers face. Think of the Christian doctors who over many centuries have chosen to forsake wealth and security at home in order to serve Jesus in third world countries. Think of pastors who sacrifice a normal family life to give almost 24-7 service to the lambs and the sheep that have been entrusted to them. Think of the hours of practice that many devoted worship leaders put in week after week behind closed doors and the faithful church elders who devote many hours every month to visit the sick, the lonely, and the bereaved. Think of those who labor week after week in much-needed ministry and counseling, or in relentless intercession for the lost. Think of the overworked and usually poorly paid church and ministry staff, not serving for personal gain or fame, but as a loving sacrifice to Jesus. Take away the sacrificial Take away the sacrificial lifestyle and Christ's kingdom will not advance as God intends it to. Take away the sacrificial lifestyle and you're left with a lifeless church. 
when teachings are focused only on what Jesus has sacrificed in love for us, we can miss the important and spiritually empowering truth that Jesus calls us to live a sacrificial, sacrificial lifestyle in love for him. He modeled the sacrificial life and linked following him <clears throat> with the sacrificial life. Matthew twenty six twenty four. then Jesus <clears throat> said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. The most dramatic sacrificial story in the Old Testament is surely the account of Abraham being asked to lay his son whom he loved so dearly on the altar for God. Genesis 22, 2. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. At the last moment, we know that God stopped the sacrifice, substituted a ram, and Isaac was able to get off the altar. Abraham had glorified and worshipped God for his obedience. 2,000 years later, the exercise was to be repeated on the exact same mountain. A father permitted his only son, whom he loved, to be led on a crude wooden altar and then be lifted up for all to see. This time, there was to be no last-minute reprieve. No ram to replace the son, because the son was the ram. The once and for all time, replacing the millions of animals that had been sacrificed for the people's sins. It was the greatest act of love the world has ever seen. But listen, as God's redeemed, beloved children, we are passionately urged to glorify and worship God by offering our bodies on the altar before God as living sacrifices. Darren mentioned the verse this morning, Romans 12, 1. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. You see, as Christians, we are called to do more than stand at the foot of the cross and gaze upon the crucified Messiah. We are called to get on the cross. To get on the cross so that self be crucified with Christ. Listen to Paul teach this truth again and again. Romans 6, 6, For we know that our old self was crucified with him. Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 5, 24, Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. God's plan to prosper us in character and fruitfulness and abundant life is that we die daily to self and live daily for Christ, considering others more than ourselves, giving rather than receiving, working with the lost, the unlovable, the outcast, forsaking the ways of the world, trusting Christ, following Christ, serving Christ, being a living letter from Christ. Jesus calls us to follow him, but he did not say count the blessings, he said count the cost. Extract from Luke 14, 26 to 33. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, these are all the things that are naturally would normally take a priority. He cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, 
cannot be my disciple. Paul modeled the sacrificial lifestyle so fully that it would take many minutes to quote all the scriptures that describe his lifestyle. One verse maybe sums them up. Philippians 2.17, he says, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you. While we continue to see the Christian lifestyle as only being defined by what God does for us, we will never bear much fruit because fruit is always a result of what God pours out of us to others. A book on symbols and types will tell you that Canaan's land, the land of promise, the land where the fruit was, stands for the believer's inheritance gained by warfare. But to enter Canaan's land, the church of the day had to cross the Jordan River. And the same book on symbols and types will tell you that the Jordan River stands for death to self. What does death to self feel like or sound like? Let me read you John Wesley's covenant prayer that he spoke in a covenant service in 1780. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full or empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Keep focused only on yourself and your blessings, And you stay on the wilderness side of the Jordan. Plenty of manna for you to eat, but no fruit. Fruit is on the other side of the Jordan. Many of us have our excuses. God hasn't given me a ministry. I have no special gifting. I have physical problems. I'm too shy. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm in financial difficulties. I don't know my Bible very well. I'm not called to do anything. I'm waiting for God to open doors for me, etc. Last month, I was in the Netherlands and I had the privilege of going to Carrie Ten Boom's house. Now, I knew your story, but you see to stand in the room where the hiding place was to get into the hiding place and to realize the Gestapo were in that very room that I was standing in, it had a deep impact on me. So I went out and, and again got a hold of, of one of her books, A Trump for the Lord. And let me read you an extract from page 175. She, Corrie, had arrived in an elderly couple's one-room apartment in Lithuania, which was Russian territory in those days. And she describes the elderly lady who lived there this way. She wrote, The old lady was lying on a small sofa, propped up by pillows. Her body was bent and twisted almost beyond recognition by the dread disease of multiple sclerosis. Her aged husband spent all his time caring for her since she was unable to move off the sofa. I walked across the room and kissed her wrinkled cheek. She tried to look up, but the muscles in her neck were atrophied so she could only roll her eyes upward and smile. She raised her right hand slowly in jerks. It was the only part of her body she could control. And with her gnarled and deformed knuckles, she caressed my face. I reached over and kissed the index finger of that hand, for it was with this one finger that she glorified God. Beside her couch was a vintage typewriter. Each morning, her faithful husband would rise, praising the Lord, After caring for his wife's needs and feeding her a simple breakfast, he would prop her into a sitting position on the couch, placing pillows all around her so that she wouldn't topple over. Then he would move that ancient typewriter in front of her on a small table. 
From an old cupboard, he would remove a stack of cheap yellow paper. Then, with that one blessed finger, she would begin to type. All day and far into the night, she would type. She translated Christian books into Russian, Latvian, and the language of her own people, always using just that one finger. Peck, peck, peck. She typed out the pages, portions of the Bible, the books of Billy Graham, Watchman Nee, and Carrie Ten Boom, and that's why Carrie was there, to say thank you. Not only does she translate the books her husband said, but she prays for these men every day while she types. Carrie arranged for a new typewriter to be sent to her along with carbon paper so that she could make copies. Sometime later, she got a letter from her husband to say that the previous week in the early morning, she had passed away. But he said she had worked up until midnight typing with that one finger to the glory of God. This was a lady who was clearly not blessed with prosperity or wealth, not even blessed with good health. Yet a lady was so blessed that Carrie Ten Boom traveled to Lithuania to meet her. A lady so blessed that she was included in Carrie's best-selling book. A lady so blessed that I am speaking about her today, many decades after she's gone to be with the Lord. But after reading her story, I thought, what's my excuse? And I'm sure after hearing her story, you might be asking yourself, what's my excuse? Several weekends ago, Ireland, on a teaching and ministry weekend, I told that lady's story because it has impacted me very much. And the next day, in the weekend, a lady came for, to see me for prayer ministry. She was suffering greatly from severe arthritis in her hands and legs, and I suspected she was coming for prayer into that. But I was wrong. Having heard that lady's story, she said she no longer cared whether Jesus healed her or not. She said, I want to make a difference. I want to serve him in any way, whatever the cost. But she said, how do I start? And that was a good question. And that is a good question. Well, here's what I said. Luke recorded in the book of Acts that Jesus, in the midst of all his miracles and his healings, went around doing good. Just doing good. Acts 10.30, at how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and the other things. You see, all of us can do good. We might not always be able to do great, but we can choose to do good. Just one chapter earlier, we read of where Dorcas went around always doing good. Acts 9.36, in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, in Greek her name is Dorcas, and she was always doing good and helping the poor. No mention here of Dorcas, great teaching, evangelizing, prophesying, healing, or doing miracles. But she's mentioned in scripture as someone who just went around doing good and helping the poor. You see, good does not get done until somebody actually does it. That's why it's called doing good. Perhaps doing good is just a friendly word to a person who clearly needs it. Perhaps it's a phone call, text, email, or letter of encouragement. Perhaps it's a few ten-pound notes in an envelope dropped anonymously through a door. Perhaps it's a bag of coal or a fill of oil delivered to a family in need in wintertime. Perhaps it's offering to babysit a young family, for a young family where mum and dad never get a free night out. Perhaps it's a warm pair of socks for a homeless man. Perhaps a visit to a lonely person. Perhaps it's getting the shopping for someone who is unwell. You see, if you can speak, you can do good. If you can walk, you can do good. If you're bedridden but can still phone, text, email, or write a letter, you can do good. If you have any money at all, you can do good. If you can go shopping, you can do good. If you have the same 24 hours in a day as everyone else, you can do good. There's no end to what everyday actions could fall into the category of just doing good. Some of the most memorable Christian brothers and sisters I have met just quietly go about doing good. They would probably be shocked if they knew that I even noticed them. Oh, but I have. 
One example, an elderly couple, now a very elderly couple that I met once, maybe 12 years ago in Scotland, who write an encouraging letter to me several times a year, always asking, what can they pray for? They have no email, no computer, nothing. And their letters so encourage me that I read them again and again, and I file them away. I'm aware just of the sheer effort at their age that they even remember after 12 years. If they are doing that for me, whom they met once, how many others are they doing that for? Imagine out of all, all the mighty men and women that I am privileged to meet along my flight path, I so easily remember the ones who just quietly go around doing good. Ask Jesus to show you what good works you can do. And if he says absolutely nothing, you're off the hook. But remember, doing good works doesn't bring you salvation. It doesn't add to your salvation. Salvation is a free gift from God. Good works outwork from your salvation, not vice versa. We all know the verse in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But as you go around just doing good, guess what? Jesus becomes magnified in your life, and both your character and your kingdom perspective change. Your focus quickly shifts from your needs to others. Certain scriptures you may have missed suddenly come alive, especially the sacrificial life verses. It is easy to weary of doing good because, of course, it runs contrary to our carnal, what about me nature. And so Paul wrote to the Christians at Galatia, telling them not to become weary in doing good. Galatians 6 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, We will reap a harvest if we don't give up. And then he repeated the instruction to the church at Thessalonica as well. He also told Titus, he also wrote to Titus, telling him to encourage his flock to maintain good works and thus be fruitful. Titus 3.14, and let our people also learn to maintain good works. In other words, not a flash in the pan next week and then think, well, that's that done. To meet urgent needs. If there's an urgent need, you have the potential to do good. Your name's not on everything. You know that. But ask God to show you when there's an urgent need. If your name's on it. Let our people learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Somehow somehow non-believers know instinctively what the Christian lifestyle should look like, And pointing out our many shortcomings is only to be expected. But just doing good, doing good deeds, doing good works can actually change something of that image that they mock. They will see something of the servant image of Christ forming. 1 Peter 2.12 and 15 says this, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. To those with a holy discontentment, I'll conclude with these simple words. The fruitful Christian lifestyle is not, what can I get? But what can I give? Not, Bless me, but let me be a blessing to others. Not give me, but send me. Not what will you do for me, but what will you do through me. Amen.